Hello and welcome to Beyond Business. This is the program where we uncover the latest trends in the global economy. Tense, difficult, but sometimes flirtatious. That's how you could characterize ties between the business world and NGOs. Just like governments, companies have come under tough scrutiny by charities and rights groups. But that's not the entire story. There are also examples of partnership between the two sides. In a moment, we'll be speaking to a consultant who advises business leaders on how to deal with NGOs. But first, let's take a closer look at a case that highlights this loaded relationship. A stunning defeat for one of the world's largest mining companies. The Indian government blocked Vedanta Resources' attempt to mine the sacred hills of the Dongria Khan tribe. Helping them throughout their uphill battle was the NGO Survival International. Based in London, this organization defends the rights of many indigenous peoples around the world. Since 1969, the NGO has been fighting on behalf of people like the Dongria against governments and companies that ignore their rights. And now their message is catching on. It's grown a lot. The problems are now much more acknowledged more widely than they once were. That is partly through organizations like Survival. Um, there's more awareness that these peoples are not automatically wanting to integrate and be assimilated with mainstream culture. In defending the Dongria, Survival International used a decidedly modern weapon, the Internet. And obviously what the Internet does now is it uh, makes it much easier for people who are interested in these issues to find us and see that there is an organization there uh, which they can use to support this cause. And it also totally changes the way that we can get our information out and get our campaign materials out. By collecting photographs and eyewitness accounts, Survival International provides not just a voice for the voiceless, but a voice with a megaphone. Each week we're sending out around three press releases to 15,000 odd journalists around the world in seven different languages. Uh, so today I'm sending out a press release about a Vedanta demonstration that we have tomorrow outside the AGM of Vedanta. The protests against Vedanta were a big story at the end of July. Activists became filmmakers and they produced and distributed the film Mine in hopes of winning public support. It went viral on the, on the internet and um, uh, over 650,000 people have now watched it. And it's been interesting seeing how it spread. You know, we, we spread it so far and then through all the social media and, and, and all the new media mechanisms, it then gets spread out um, to vast numbers of people that we couldn't hope to reach directly. Relying on a large group of collaborators around the world, it was only natural that Survival International would turn to social media. Now Facebook and Twitter are indigenous people's strongest allies. There's just a huge network of people, hundreds of thousands of people around the world now connected to tribal peoples and connected to survival's work through the survival website and, and through social media. It's incredibly powerful. Yeah. With such power comes responsibility. Some companies and governments accuse NGOs like Survival International of being overprotective and slowing economic growth. For that reason, they must be diligent and exhaustive in their research. And when people come along, like Survival International or Indigenous Peoples, um, who are standing up for their rights and, and contradict the companies, of course they're going to, to stoop to anything they can to discredit you. It's, it's like a war, it's a game. And, and my answer to that is that actually Survival International would not put out any bit of information unless we were absolutely sure of its veracity. An ugly truth can be enough to stop big business. U.S. oil giants withdrew from the Amazon, and Malaysian companies are quitting deforestation. Now the Dongria can continue living on their sacred lands. Okay, for more now, we can turn to Jérôme Aurillac, who's the founder and head of the B-Linked Agency. It's a consultancy that specializes in advising companies of uh, or in how to deal with NGOs. So welcome to France 24. Thank you. Uh, let me first ask you this. What's your reaction to the example that we just saw in this report? How typical is it for an NGO and for a multinational to, to, to clash in such an obvious way? It's just, as you said, typical. 
typical of uh, a, a nowadays uh, typology of uh, relationship between a global NGO that's working on uh, new, uh, pretty new issues uh, that companies don't necessarily take into account mm -hmm. uh, when they, they enter a new market and uh, a company that's uh, totally uh, reluctant to make some changes uh, in order to integrate those new issues uh, in its core business uh, and integrate answers to these new issues in its core business. But we had one voice there in that report saying this is basically like a war between NGOs and between businesses. Would you agree with that? Yeah, uh, I agree with that, but I also would like to uh, give another perspective uh, because not all relationships between NGOs and companies are uh, war or, or fight relationships. Mm -hmm. uh, the question of, uh, of campaign or, or campaigning is, is crucial because those uh, populations, they, they don't have any tools or means to uh, raise awareness about their situation. So the NGO is just a, a key partner uh, for them. Uh, in the other end, uh, when you look at the, the way uh, businesses are trying to integrate social environmental issues uh, in their strategies uh, for the last 10 years, let's say, um, you can notice uh, some changes. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a lot of communication about that, but uh, you can observe that uh, major companies are trying to integrate NGOs as partners uh, in order to better understand what's at stake at a local level mm -hmm. uh, and try to try to find new solutions. What would you advise a company like Vedanta Resources, a, a company that's in a similar situation? What kind of steps would you advise it to take? It's very complicated to, to give some advices uh, when there's a, a huge crisis because everybody is feeling the emotion of it. The relationship uh, has already the, broken down yeah. to, to a large extent. Yeah. Uh, I would say that it, it's a good thing to listen to what the NGOs uh, have to say first. Mm -hmm. uh, not everything that the NGOs is, uh, is saying is wrong. And if they are uh, campaigning against the company, there might be something wrong in the way the company uh, has listened uh, to its... Uh, stakeholders and specifically NGOs or local population at the beginning, the early beginning of the project. So basically business leaders, sometimes they need to take a, a, a step back, if you will, and, and take in everything that's going on around them. Yeah, because uh, what we are trying to, to build with uh, companies and NGOs uh, is uh, tools in order to better first uh, understand each other's uh, strategies and uh, what's at stake. Uh, and trying to find solutions. So if you look at the, the crisis management or the issue management at a very specific point of the crisis between Vedanta and survival, mm -hmm. uh, you will only find emotions. And we don't think it's a good way to, to work, to work only on the emotional part of it. But how does a company like Vedanta engage with an NGO like survival? Do you just... Should business leaders basically knock on the door of the NGO and ask if you Sometimes could sit down and talk? It is as simple as that. Uh, but business leaders are generally reluctant to that. Uh, why? Because, not because they, they fear NGOs, because they don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, they have not been uh, prepared to do such things. Business so, is a very different thing from campaigning. Yeah, uh, but... In the end, you will find, and uh, in most of the case, uh, when you sit with people around the table uh, and uh, everybody is listening to each other, uh, it's a huge step forward to building new solutions. Because we have also seen examples of how companies and NGOs ha have partnered up. Could yeah. you tell us uh, uh, maybe one or two of those examples? If you look at uh, environmental issues and uh, the FSC, the, the Forest Stewardship Council, that has been built up uh, mainly by NGOs, such as the WWF and other big and global NGOs and companies, mm. uh, in order to uh, design new ways of uh, uh, working in the forestry industry. 
uh, if you look at uh, another example, more, much more on the innovation side, uh, what Danone is doing uh, with a lot of NGOs worldwide in order to understand how he can design new products uh, for the population with low incomes, mm -hmm. uh, the, the role of local NGOs that have that social engineering uh, capacities uh, and that, that very local understanding of what's at stake uh, in a village, uh, in a city, uh, with those new, let's say, consumers mm -hmm. uh, or the future consumers, uh, it's key for companies to understand better what they want, not what they only want to consume, but also how they would like to interact mm -hmm. with a company. We don't have a lot of time left, but just one, one, one brief question about the internet and how the internet has changed this, this yeah. relationship. It seems as if social media have strengthened the hand of NGOs. Would you say that's correct? And is yeah. there that kind of awareness within the corporate community, within the business community? Yeah, I think the corporate and the business community are totally aware of that. But uh, let's say that NGOs have always uh, a step in advance, uh, looking at companies' strategies in terms of uh, communication on social medias. I would say that this is a, a combination, uh, the power of NGOs, uh, especially for advoca advocacy NGOs, is a combination of a, a very good, uh, often a very good uh, information coming from the ground, mm -hmm. from local partners, and a huge capacity to raise awareness uh, among social medias. All right, uh, Jérôme Aurillac, thanks very much indeed for taking Thank the time you, to speak to us. And with that, we're going to wrap up uh, this program. Thanks for watching Beyond Business.